Oh, thank you again for being here on this Friday afternoon. I am going to share a few slides, but this is definitely going to be an interactive session. Um, so there will be times that I will be pausing to pose questions and then leaving room uh, toward the end for a interactive dialogue. So the title of my session today is Honoring the Sacred in the Secular Classroom. And the types of questions that we will be exploring today is, are, how do we make room for teachers and learners to connect with what they hold sacred while avoiding religious indoctrination or dogma? How do we open to interior ways of knowing via contemplation, intuition, and imagination while maintaining academic rigor? And what role does the sacred play in our collective socio-political liberation? So those are some big questions. This could take a lifetime to explore. But I wanna start by sharing my story. So currently I am a core faculty member in the Women's Spirituality Program at the California Institute of Integral Studies. But my academic journey uh, as a, in higher ed began with a graduate program in Women's Studies at the University of Washington, which was definitely a very secular program grounded in, I would say more of a socialist materialist intersectional framework. I was in my 20s and I was really inspired by the sort of opening of my mind around intersectional feminisms. At the same time, I was going through a deep inner journey of dealing with depression, um, reckoning with familial trauma, trying to figure out the meaning and purpose of my existence. And I decided to embark on a path of meditation. Um, I grew up with a Hindu background, but because for various reasons that I don't have time to get into today, I decided to explore the Buddhist path of meditation. Simultaneously, I was reading all sorts of spiritual books, mystical books, new age books, all sorts of things, trying to make sense of my place in this world. Um, and how did I make sense of suffering? How did I make sense of all the rampant injustice that not only had I seen or even experienced, but that I was becoming more and more, um, I was becoming more and more aware of through my studies. And I felt like I had a split personality at times. There was my spiritual self when I was at the bookstore looking at the newest <laughs> um, self-help book and my academic and political self when I was in my graduate program. I ended up working on bringing these together through my work um, in my dissertation, which was on women's spiritual activism. Uh, and I was so fortunate to find a place like the California Institute of Integral Studies, where there was a focus on what's called integral education, which is something I'm going to be talking about today, but about bringing the mind, body, and spirit into the classroom. However, when I got to CIS, uh, which is the acronym for my university, I found that many students who were deeply interested in holistic or spiritual education, not all of them, but many, saw that as completely separate from sociopolitical issues. I would hear things like, you know, why do we have to talk about, you know, racism and sexism? Is, aren't those identities just separating at us when we're, you know, all ultimately one? Um, I saw people who didn't want to read the news or didn't want to engage in what was going on. And so I really began to notice that this split um, was occurring once again between the spiritual growth of journey and the sociopolitical. I think in the last decade or so, there's been a, a growing discourse um, that's sort of healing the split. So I can't, you know, I think that there's so much coming, particularly from scholars of color and women of color who are reclaiming ancestral practices. Um, and talking about the inseparability of social and spiritual liberation. Um, so I feel very honored to be part of that growing discourse. So I want to, I shared a bit of my story. So I want to pause for a moment and invite everyone to reflect on the following questions. 
Um, and feel free to share, you don't have to share a long essay about each of these questions, but feel free to share a few words, a sentence, or some thoughts in the chat. We'll take a couple minutes pause to just sort of marinate in these questions. What brought you to this session? And I'm actually especially curious to hear your thoughts on the second question. What does the sacred mean to you? And what has been the key to your own, um, as feminist scholar Lata Mani calls, sacred secular journey? And she talks about that term to sort of like pull us out of the um, sort of split again, you know, recognizing that political, like we secular society does offer something, right? We're not trying to um, move into, you know, at least I'm not into spheres of religious education or um, a sphere where everyone has to have the same religious or spiritual perspective. But at the same time, we don't want to cut off um, that part of ourselves that yearns to connect with something that we find sacred. So we'll just take a couple moments and um, I'd love to see some of your thoughts in the chat. Liz wrote, sacred means full heartedness and is connected to my spiritual being and is the foundation of authentic learning. So belongs in the classroom. I love that framing. Oh, courage. Sacred is courage to open to and listen to the heart. That's beautiful. So I, uh, you feel free to continue adding to the chat as I move forward. Um, so I mentioned previously that I teach at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And as part of my time here, I've been working on one of my areas of scholarship has been on developing an integration of um, a lineage called integral education with the lineage of feminist and critical education. And I don't have um, time today to go into the whole intellectual lineage of integral education, but my school was founded by um, followers of a philosopher, a mystic and philosopher from India named Sri Aurobindo and um, his spiritual partner, Mira Alfasa. And they really believed that, you know, education should focus on whole person wisdom and not just on the intellect and not just on one aspect of ourselves. These are a few of the basic principles of integral education. Integral educators believe that we must foster educational spaces where the numinous dimensions of existence are explored without dogma. And I think one of the challenges um, of this type of work is depending on where you are in the world, um, many places are, there's a very strong sort of um, religious fundamental list streams. Um, and so talking about um, spirituality in the classroom become, can become very fraught because it can be appear as if you're trying to push a particular ideology upon students. Um, and then of course, there are those who want to, you know, create more sort of, um, traditional religious education, right? So but the work of integral education is to create a space where people can say, you know, we're not here all believing in the same religion or the same philosophy or the same spirituality, but we all are curious about it, you know, or maybe we, we wanna talk about, well, you know, for my faith tradition, this is what justice means. Or for me, I don't believe in um, a God or a religion, but there's something deeply sacred about connecting with the earth. Right. So to have room where um, people can use that kind of language and even talk about their faith without assuming that everyone shares that same faith or is, you know, that there's any attempt to convert anyone. Another key aspect of integral education is engaging students in their lives to support their psychological and spiritual drive toward wholeness. Traditionally, um, education in many parts of the world has been just focused on intellectual knowledge, memorizing facts at the very basic level up to analyzing and even creating new knowledge in higher education. But that inner journey um, can often be ignored. One of the ways that I experienced this as a student was, um, you know, being uh, in a class on women and violence. And this was before the time of trigger warnings and trauma-informed teaching and being inundated with 
facts and figures and political analysis, but having no space in the classroom to think about what the spiritual wound was of being barraged by these stories. Um, you know, now that we are in a different space where there's more awareness of trauma, um, I still think that we have a long way to go because something like a trigger warning, for instance, I don't believe is enough. Um, I believe when we're talking about any, any topic that touches the human soul or human spirit, that we need to actually foster some space within the classroom um, for students to process um, the emotional impact of what they're learning and to also put it in context of their own personal journey. Now, some students will think of that in spiritual terms. Some people won't resonate with that word per se, um, but they maybe talk about meaning or purpose or other terms that really refer to what ultimately matters to us. Another aspect of integral education, embracing multiplicity, complexity, and paradox. So this is really that also, um, I think, connects to intellectual humility, recognizing that there isn't one correct perspective, whether that's spiritual or political or any aspect of the material world, um, but really being willing to see things in more nuanced and complex ways. And this ties into sort of destabilizing that power um, hierarchy between teachers and students insofar as you know, we recognize that there isn't one sole authoritative voice. Finally, integral educators, are, it's very important to foster hope in the possibility of transformation. So um, particularly for those who um, teach in the realm of eco-social justice, it can be very easy to talk about the problems and uh, to focus on the dire situation that we may find ourselves in. Um, and fostering hope is not about some sort of, you know, glib, you know, pie in the sky sort of um, simplistic way of thinking. But it's really, I would say, you know, part of what Joanna Macy calls an active hope, um, recognizing that, you know, we active hope is based on taking our own actions, right? So knowing that uh, if I'm taking my own actions to create a more just world, that gives me hope that a more just world is possible. Even if that's just within particular spaces and communities. And one of the key ideas of integral education also comes from the yogic tradition um, with this term called svadharma, which means one's own unique path. And it's this idea that even though it comes from that tradition that I think people of many traditions might be able to relate to, which is that, you know, there isn't one universal purpose or journey in life. And there's this concept in the yogic tradition um, from one of the sacred texts that it is better to do your own dharma or live your own path, however imperfectly, than to live another's dharma perfectly. And one thing that I try to, uh, I use this concept with students too, is to talk about, you know, to help with that comparison thing, like, oh, but this other student or this other person has already, you know, published an article and I, you know, I'm here raising my kids or, you know, I'm dealing with my health issues to, to be able to say, like, we all have our own unique path, right? and different ways of being involved in eco-social justice. Some people will be the organizers and the protesters, and some people will be the writers, and some people will be the healers, and some people will be, you know, just really tend to their family healing and their healing of intergenerational trauma. And some people will be more than one of those. But, you know, we have to cult help students cultivate, and within ourselves, educators too, it's not really a binary between this is a student and this is an educator recognizing what our own unique path is. So to summarize, um, these are some of the key ideas of integral education as I've sort of summarized from the literature and from my own experience. Um, focusing on the numinous dimensions of existence, engaging students in our lives, embracing multiplicity, complexity, and paradox, fostering hope, and supporting students in transforming their own, traversing their own unique path.
And I want to um, actually open it up for some comments now. And I'm going to go back to that slide so you can see the tenets. I don't expect you to have that all memorized. Um, is in what ways are you an integral educator? Which tenets do you resonate with? And in what ways would you like to grow? So it's really just a general reflection on these tenets. And we'll take about, you know, between five and 10 minutes for comments, depending upon um, how many folks want to share. And it'd be great to actually hear some voices if you feel comfortable doing so. You're also welcome to write in the chat. And uh, I, I can't see everyone at once. So feel free to unmute yourself. Ksenia, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, I just cannot see you all. I can see you, but it's all right. I cannot see the whole group. Well, my, my thing is how can I ensure, I'm a teacher, I teach at university, I teach social work. And my thing is how can I ensure that I don't impose my beliefs because of my position of power mm. and how of course you do that unintentionally but you still do it mm -hmm. and i'm just thinking how can i ensure that under the guise of this is totally non-dogmatic this is your spirituality explore your inner self integrative and all that so what are the i mean supervision yeah, anyway, I was just wondering if you've got any thoughts about that. How do you how do you keep your dogma in check? Because mm. <laughs> that's, that's my great, question. That's a yeah. great question. And I would actually love to bring that question back to the collective um, and see if anyone has thoughts on that. I, I don't have a thought, but I do want to make a note about the word dogma and how we haven't really defined that in this conversation. And I've, I, I've identified it even myself and I have a very expansive spirituality, but I have my own dogmas <laughs> and that my, my, my non-negotiables, you know? And so I, I resonate with what Ksenia is saying. Like I do have, I have dogma. And so obviously how do I, I just, I resonate with that question. Like how do we, make space and not bring our own, <laughs> even though we have them. Yeah. And then we do, if, if we are in, integrative teachers, we do bring our own. We bring our, our self is our instrument. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I love this conversation. Yeah, yo. And Sorry, please correct also, me if I mispronounced your name. Anyone? Yeah, yo is perfect. I know. If it sounds something like that, I will know that it's for me. So I, I also doesn't have an answer, but uh, something that might help and at least have helped me that have my own self-made dogmas because I grew up in a uh, atheist religious family. Um, <laughs> so I have to, to search for myself for my own spirituality path is to understand uh, more than dogma, this, this man that worked a lot in interculturality called Raymond Panikar, called the homeomorphic, what make you a human level of, of intelligence, that is the things that you know that you don't know that you know, or that need no further justification or logical explanation, no? So as, for me, what is helpful is to, to understand and there's several levels or, diff or very different ways at that level of, of homeomorphical knowledge in the world. And uh, there is no way to prove one is wrong and one is right. So like accepting the coexistence of several ways of view. I use so often the image of a kaleidoscope, you No, know, for me, uh, getting close to the divine and rituals are very useful to, to understand this is like look take a look in the kaleidoscope and then someone else have another view and it shifts every time you look at it mm. so if you can keep that in mind it's it's easy to keep in check your dogmas and say like mm. oh no I, I'm, I'm moving in this level and that's true for me but who knows well who how it uh, resonates with other ones. Thank you. Thank That's you. a beautiful metaphor. Thank you. Lucy. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I, as I was listening to everyone speak, and apologies, my camera is off. I have a dodgy internet. Um, as I was hearing everyone speak, I was reflecting on an experience I actually had as a student, which very much inspires my practice as an educator today. And that was being taken as part of a university subject to Oroville in India, where Sri Aurobindo and the mother have very much um, grounded their work and space in an intentional community. And there my tutor led a group of 20 of us on what I would call a spiritual journey. And that question of how we as educators, I think, honour and acknowledge our own beliefs, practices, positionality in the classroom whilst also opening up space for students. This was such a great example of that because I couldn't have had the experience I had without my tutor actually sharing her own beliefs and paths. But it was done in a way where that came with an invitation, as we've been talking about, for all of us to have our own experiences and actually discover what spirituality and the sacred felt like, looked like for us within that space. So I guess just to say I don't have the answers, but it is possible for us to hold those both things at once, an invitation for our students and our own our own beliefs. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. And there's a um and I don't know if it's Said or Shade said Proudly show your beliefs and encourage and support students to show theirs, no matter how different. Um, and I want to briefly speak to that and then um, give the mic to Devin, which is, you know, just like we cannot be fully politically neutral, we all have our standpoints based on our life experiences, based on the isms that we've experienced or the privileges that we've had. Um, there's a lot of power in making what is implicit explicit right? So rather than letting your dogma drive your work without actually naming it, there's a power in saying, you know, I actually am an atheist, but I'm really interested in what, how people think about the sacred. What does the sacred mean to you? Or to be able to say, you know, I am a practicing Catholic, but I'm very open to interfaith dialogue and, you know, to just be able to like, I think it's a question of constantly interrogating oneself, but we can never be completely free of coming from a particular perspective or even dogma. And Devin. Uh, um, I just wanna thank you for this space and this dialogue. It's like so amazing for me because for a long time now I've been seeking, you know, this kind of conversation, this kind of community. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, one thought I had is just like, you know, the structure of the learning and the protocols can make all the difference in whether or not it feels like there's any hierarchy in the learning space. Um, and I was I was part of a workshop I helped co-facilitate about a year and a half ago. And the learning was, um, you know, around critical race theory. And like, so what if teachers are, Chris, you know, this big thing about critical race theory, like, what if we are teaching critical race theory? What's so scary about what it actually is? Mm -hmm. And the learning was really just, you know, there were articles that were sent out and then every time we met, um, people proposed um, breakout rooms and like proposed questions and everybody chose where they wanted to be and, and discuss the learning and people could move between rooms, people could change, they could stay in one room, they could go to all the rooms. Um, there's the open space protocol and people could choose if they wanted to be more like the, you know, the, the bumblebee sort of moving from to room or more like the, the butterfly sort of creating silence and space and staying in one place. And it was very, very powerful to see educators not dominating or, or teaching as the expert. It was, um, yeah, there's, there's some learning protocols that really invite, um, you know, sort of e equity in the conversation I feel like, and, and sort of non-power dynamics. Yeah. Thank you for that beautiful reflection, Devin. Very much appreciated. I will add one caveat that, um, this kind of thing can be tougher to do if you're in spaces where any of the students or learners are very wedded to trying to uh, believe in only one path, right? And at my current institution, we tend not to get so many of those students, but even sometimes people are very dogmatic about their alternative spirituality too. <laughs> 
Um, but when I was a graduate student at the University of Washington, you know, I was um, TAing for my mentor uh, a class on gender, religion, and spirituality. And there was one student, young woman, who was very much um, a, a quote non-denominational Christian that was, you know, really believed that that was the only path, right? And everyone else was going to burn, right? If they didn't believe that, and. You know, I wasn't very developed in my pedagogy at the time, um, but when if I think about now, like how would I handle that? I think it would have to be with like very clear learning protocols right at the outset of the class. Um, and if this is in a space where it's an elective course that a student could like, like if this isn't something you're willing to agree to, that we're not gonna proselytize, um, then this maybe is not the course for you, right? Um, but if it's in a different sort of space where the student has to be there, I think it's really about, you know, sort of accepting that that's where that person is, but you're not going to let them, you know, as a facilitator, you have a responsibility to not let them harm anyone else. Um, and by intervening again with, you know, group agreements and protocols around um, not putting down other people's uh, beliefs or orientations or things of that nature. Renee. Um, so listening to Devin and yourself talk about these protocols and frameworks and group agreements, do you have resources, maybe we're getting there, to recommend like, you know, like here's what I use or here's, you know, a, a document that kind of can walk you through it? Because those things are really helpful, like what you mm -hmm. guys are saying sounds really helpful. Thank you. And if you want to get in touch afterwards, I'm happy to share, send some of the agreements that we use very much in my program. Um, but in my teaching, sometimes what I'll do is start with just a few core agreements like confidentiality, um, and then really collectively create agreements based on what the students want to add to the space. Um, and, and again, it all depends upon how much time you have, right? Like I if this were a longer workshop, I might have taken a few um, minutes to actually share some agreements. If this was a two day workshop, we would actually collectively come up with some. Right. So you kind of like and if it's a full class. Right. Then I, and you build in space to collectively address them. Um, yeah. And some folks are saying that they they do spend that time and think that it's very important. Um, and, and it can, you know, taking that time up front can actually end up um kind of reducing some friction later on which can also which also takes up a lot of time to deal with and, and not to say that it completely obviates it because things still do come up and we have a great link here to the art of hosting so thank you everyone for that wonderful dialogue and i'm going to check that book out too the art of holding space um i want to move on and then we all we will have some more time for dialogue uh, toward the end. So I want to talk a little bit about politicizing integral education. I sort of already implicitly talked about that, um, but I have written, published around the model called Integral Feminist Pedagogy, which I'm happy to share with folks um, after the session is over. But uh, I mentioned earlier that when I first came to CIS, I noticed that even though the founder of integral philosophy was actually an anti-colonial revolutionary when integral education came to California um, and was taken up by middle and upper middle class white folks, it was often depoliticized, right? It was like, I gotta get my spiritual healing and I gotta do my cycle, look at my shadow, my psychological growth and kind of step away from all that, you know, or not even be aware of race, class, gender, sexuality stuff. So. Um, what I argue is we really need to bring that piece back um, and that integral education in a contemporary context is best when it's integrated with insights from feminism, critical pedagogy, decolonial pedagogies, which also indigenous pedagogies, eco-pedagogies and others. Um, and, you know, the I may not have time today to get into all of the nuances of that, but it's really sort of recognizing that we are, we have um, a political identity and we also have our spiritual, um, our soul journeys, you know, whatever that looks like for each person. Um, and that our individual journeys are embedded within a larger socio-political um, and ecological space. 
and that we're looking at, you know, really recognizing and transforming some of those power relationships and recognizing that, you know, spiritual spaces, whether they're in um, traditional religions or, you know, um, more modern, you know, sort of idiosyncratic spiritualities have been very much imbued with power imbalances, right? So we have to name the sexism and the hierarchies and the homophobia um, and recognize that those are part of our spiritual traditions too. Um, and that, you know, it takes a lot of um, sort of inner and outer work to, um, to develop new ways of collecting around our souls and our sacredness. It doesn't reproduce those historical hierarchies. And so part of politicizing integral education is really like recognizing that we're focusing on collective transformation rather than hyper individualized spirituality. Like I said, I do see a lot of really good movement in this area, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years with the work of folks like Resna Menikin, um, a lot of who talks about, you know, somatic, um, somatic anti-racism, um, folks who are looking at intergenerational trauma uh, and healing right, which has this like that healing has a spiritual component, but also this very much political component. So what are some of the ways that this ties to eco-social justice education? So we talked about some theory here and let's want to talk a little bit more about application. Um, and there's, you know, many, many different ways of applying this and I'd love to hear your ideas. Um, but I see part of it is if you are a social justice educator and ecological educator, really support students' thirst for meaning and purpose. Now, if you're in a space where, you know, it's sort of verboten to use the word spiritual or even soul, like there's other ways to get to what's sacred to people by talking about what is it that's of, as the, you know, theologian um, Tillich has said, like, what is it of ultimate concern for you, right? What is it that gives your life meaning? Um, how do you see your purpose? Um, encourage students to draw upon, again, depending on your space where you can use the word spiritual or not, but their own values and practices. Um, again, rather than imposing what yours might be, you know, whether that's, you know, for someone it might be prayer, for someone it might be spending time in nature, for another it could be mindfulness meditation. Um, and also I wanna just name that we are in a time and space where, um, the youth especially, um, I mean, I think everyone, but you, there, we know that there's a mental health crisis, um, at least very much so in the United States. And I imagine it's happening in other places as well. Um, and, and I think that part of that can be when there's a lack of connection to meaning and purpose. Um, of course, there's other facets to that as well, but I think it's really important to name that. Um, I want to talk here also about challenging spiritual bypassing. Now, that's a term that came from psychologist John Wellwood, who argued that, you know, sometimes people use certain spiritual practices like meditation or contemplation to try to, like, overcome their personal sort of psychological challenges, right? And I had some of that when I was in my 20s going to my first long meditation retreats. I'm like, I just want to be up here. Like, I just want to find this, like, peace, right? Um, and it took me a long time to see like, wow, there's still a lot of like unearthing of my um, lineage and my personal trauma that I need to deal with. I can't just stay up here in this sort of blissed out space. Um, I think that concept, even though it came from a psychological lens, can be applied to sociopolitical realities too, as I mentioned earlier. Um, folks, again, who want to say like, well, we're all one or I don't see color or you know, I just visualize peace and wellness for everyone and, you know, kind of like avoiding um, the messy realities of this human existence. Um, and I think as educators, we can also name racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and ecocide as spiritual issues, again, with a very broad definition of spiritual as like that which is of ultimate concern to us. I want to share a very specific example um, of how one uh, teacher, uh, Zenju Earthlin Manuel, who is a Zen priest, um, a queer black Zen priest, uh, writes in the way of tenderness. You know, one practice, again, depending on the kind of space that you're in, if you're in an educational space that's open um, to doing this kind of inner work, is to ask questions like, when hearing about racism, what arises in my mind? 
Do I identify with the agent, target, or neither? How do I protect my ego? So this kind of drops that question of racism and anti-racism. I mean, the sort of the theoretical um, political analysis is really important, but questions like these can help people drop in to um, their own personal relationship to the topic. Um, and of course, opening questions like these takes a lot of skillful facilitation um, to work with what comes up in those types of responses. And I'd love to have a conversation with you all about what that might look like if we have time. Some other examples of how um, the kinds of questions that you know, can be used as dialogue prompts. So the first one is from um, a course I teach on ecofeminism and animal ethics. And this question is just again, to make the implicit explicit. Right? It's not to say that there's one right religious way of looking at this, but to ask students reflect in a paper, like what did your religious upbringing teach you about how humans should relate to animals? You know, That question can also be see, you know, how, what did your religion teach you um, about how we should relate to the earth? And sometimes I'll kind of vary the phrasing to recognize that not everyone comes from a religious tradition. So I might say you're, philosophical upbringing. So maybe your parents were secular humanists or never talked about it, but there was something, there was still some philosophical idea you got from your culture, right? That maybe you've never thought about before. Um, and I found that in that course that many students have never been asked that question and just like reflecting on it made a lot of implicit beliefs conscious so they could examine them. Um, other questions that kind of get to like meaning and purpose is what motivates you to work toward eradicating racism. Um, the third question is really about cultivating our imaginations, right? So it's about like, what would a day be like in a world without sexism? You know, like we might um, be in a class where there's a lot of feminist theory and readings and um, ideas promoted, but like, there's a lot of power in just like that creativity of imagining what a different world might look like. Um, I think another sort of a question that gets to what's sacred, um, because I think of also like the sacred as having a sense of innate worth and dignity, right? So a question could be like, how do we maintain self-regard and dignity in an unjust, unjust world, particularly those who've been you know, marginalized or even demonized for their sexuality or their race or, you know, being a woman or a non-gender conforming person, right? What are the ways you can open up that space and ask students, like, what gives you that, um, that inner spirit, that self-regard, right? People can get ideas from each other. And then that piece about that personal dharma or path, you know, could be a question if you're teaching a question that deals with, a course that deals with ecology, What's your unique contribution toward ecological and social change, right? Not everyone's going to be doing the same path or being the same sort of activist or, you know, um, scholar or worker in any way, right? But really giving space and time for students, not to say that they have to have the answer right away, right? But a quite an open question, right? To, to look at what their own unique path might be. Um, so now we have time for collective dialogue and idea sharing. So, um, and then I want, I'm gonna actually jump ahead to this last one, which is if anyone wants to screenshot this or take a photo, um, I'm sure we'll follow up as well with information, but, um, oh, that got cut to another line. Um, that's my website, my email, my Instagram handle. And if you want to, um, if you have your phone on you, if you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, you can take a picture of that. And I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, Sophie, did you have a question? No, I was just also going to mention that I'll drop in the chat the Reimagining Mighty Networks, which is a community okay. that everyone can join. I think a lot of people are familiar with Mighty at this point. So we're definitely going to be weaving the conversations and harvesting there. Oh, so fabulous. I'll drop that link as well. Fabulous. Well, now and we ju have time just for an announcement about that. It's going to be open at least for six months after the conference ended. So like, it's a very good place to continue conversations.
So now we have, you know, 20, 25 minutes to just like chat. Um, and I'd love to hear from folks um, if there's anyone who hasn't had a chance to share yet, but has felt something stirring within them. And what I would really encourage you to think about is that if there is something stirring within you that feels like it needs to be said, that it probably will really support others in this community. Um, and I understand it can be challenging to speak up with a bunch of folks that you don't know. Um, and if it feels like there's something that wants to be said, um, this is an invitation. And of course, you can also put comments in the chat as well. If I, I, I can't find my raise my hand, but if I could speak, I'm Paula Petrie. And um, yeah, I, I love this conversation. I'm uh, I kind of bailed uh, from academia um, 15 years ago and went into shamanic energy medicine studies. And now I'm blending everything for youth. And um, I feel that uh, there's well, there's so much resistance in traditional education. It's, it's having to create things on parallel tracks, but I'm feeling that the support of science now with the, the science of consciousness, the existence of the information field is a really valuable uh, content to be interwoven into the discussions of spirituality and just would like to have uh, your thoughts about that. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Paula, for sharing. I really appreciate it. May I ask uh, what discipline you were in? I was in, uh, I was in the School of Medicine, Department mm. of Pediatrics and Disability Studies, coming from a family-centered care perspective and teaching that and working in disability advocacy for, for 25 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I can relate to what you said about sort of having um, absconded from academia, I was very close to doing that myself. Um, and then I found, you know, a place like CIS where I could, I could do the work that I do. And, and I think that more people are doing it in other places as well nowadays. But um, I think that sort of the scientific validation of um, traditional, ancient and cross-cultural spiritual examples is a double-edged sword. I mean, on the one hand, um, I think it does create more room and space for people to bring things in like mindfulness into the classroom because it's been secularized and divorced from its religious context um, and you know, verified in scientific studies about the benefits of mindfulness and things like that. But then the, the downside of that is that it's sort of like we're still centering um, a Western scientific materialist worldview. Um, and at sometimes divorcing practices like mindfulness from their cultural and you know ethical roots, right? Um, like a, yeah, it's very tricky because like and there's a course that I teach where we read this book called Extraordinary Knowing, um, where the author gives examples of you know doctors who like share their stories of like um, basically non ordinary stories of seeing, uh, knowing when it was time to operate on someone because of a certain light that they saw, or like these sort of like mystical stories. And because these stories came from doctors and scientists, it like added this weight to it, right? Um, and, and I think for some people who are in that worldview, we really need that, right? We really need to see these kind of ideas validated from within people within that worldview. Um, but then I think, in parallel, others of us might need to be like, you know what, I don't need that rest, that justification, right? Because I'm going to justify my beliefs within my own cultural lineage or something different, right? Um, so yeah, I really think it's it's double-edged, and but I, I do think that it, it can help in some ways, um, in some context. So thank you for that, Paula. There's a question in the chat. From Nariman. Ah. I understand the historical roots that led to this evasiveness, tiptoeing around religion and its attribution to dogmatism. My experience with religion was far from dogmatic. And I wonder where is actually the conversation on religion within the spiritual? Oh, that's such a good question. That's a very deep question. Um, 
I think that there is room for that conversation, absolutely. And I think it depends on the specific context, right? In which, um, so oftentimes we have this, you know, I think in contemporary Western society, at least, there's become sort of this like high binary between religion and spirituality, right? Um, in some progressive communities, religion is associated with everything dogmatic and bad and spirituality with everything sort of progressive and good. Um, and yet there is a, a communal and social and ethical aspect to religion, right? That can sometimes be missing in like hyper, very individualized spirituality. And, you know, some spiritual folks can also become very dogmatic and create their own sort of cults around spiritual ideas, right? So I think we do need to complicate that binary a little bit. Um, I think the tricky part comes, especially uh, the context in which you're teaching, right? So if I'm like in my program, we have courses on like world religions and women in world religions and different religion traditions. And that's part of what people are wanting to learn, right? But I think if you're, um, I don't know, within a different context, it, there can be some danger, I think, in, in, because of political secularism, right, in like, being too associated with a specific religion, right, because then it becomes, it doesn't, it's no longer a secular education then. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking aloud here. So I'd love to hear other people's thoughts as well. You know, especially thoughts that are grounded in your you know, specific context. So sorry for speak again, but I'm very curious of of to know your uh, your ideas or you or what do you think about this that is happening in Mexico recently, but in the whole Abjajala, the Latin American region with indigenous rituals and cultures um, that so like, and I have a conversation with some elders of the Nahua tradition that are, I'm close to, when they open to everyone and say like, we need to spread our practices and our words mm -hmm. and our medicine. And, but what I'm noticing more and more is that the ritual have became a commodity, you know? And mm -hmm. then, so you could have now a cacao ceremony run by a blonde Swiss uh, uh, guy in the Mayan uh, region or th mm -hmm. in things like that, you know? And then costs hundreds of dollars. So when I asked their opinion of that, they were saying, it really doesn't matter if the purpose is right. So the ritual, it, it really does, there's no dogma how you do the ritual. Because actually the ceremony starts when the ritual finish, you know, it's a, the ritual is only about to share uh, for you to remember what is the important things of how to live, because that is a spirituality is the thing that you do every day. But I'm still concerned of how actually this commodification of ritual actually enabled you to get that deep contact with the spirit and to understand that it's in my every interaction that I do so. How, how could you work with that teaching about a spirituality or, or, or approaching with people that are already used to, oh, I have my ayahuasca ceremony mm -hmm. on March, so I am diet and things like that. But I'm still going to the gym or to my everyday class because that's my, my urban way of living. Yeah, that, that, that's a really profound question. And, and again, sort of to decenter myself for a moment, I want to hear other folks' thoughts on that. Amanda, I feel like you want to say something. And I know Amanda, so. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I have the pleasure of um, being one of Alka's students. And um, so that's why I came to the space. Yedo, your question is really resonating with me. I don't know that I have a fully formed answer, but it's a question that's very close to my heart because I am originally from Mexico. I live in the United States and I live in an area that's a confluence of many different cultures. And so I see firsthand how some of the practices that I know from my home country are 
transformed, adapted, reshaped, retooled by descendants and like the diaspora of that culture. And then how those rituals or practices are further adapted, transformed, transcribed into um, what I call United Statesian culture, right? Estadounidense. We don't have a word for that in English. Um, oh, so God, wanna... thank you for that. Thank you for that, for understanding that America goes from Alaska to Patagonia. Absolutely. Um, so, so in the United States, I see a lot of what you're describing. And I think while this is not an answer so much as one thing I offer to folks, especially people who are like, I'm going to Mexico to do, um, you know, a cacao ceremony, or I'm going to Costa Rica again to do my meditation retreat. And that's all beautiful. And I ask, like, how did you come to that? Have you been invited? Who are you practicing with? Who are your teachers? Who are your mentors? Because I think one thing that happens a lot is um, I hear from my people in Mexico that they are honored that some of these rituals and practices are being taken to the greater world. And at the intersection of place where I am, I see how actually what is an honor to people from the land of origin or the place of origin of some of those practices feels very different for people who are already disenfranchised from that, who are already part of a diaspora or a, a, a confluence where all of that is already changed to then see, as you mentioned, practitioners whose lived experiences don't originate from that be the people who are profiting from guiding and participating in those. So I ask, you know, who are your teachers? How did you come to that practice? Who invited you to the retreat center in Costa Rica or the cacao ceremony in Mexico? Um, is this something that you've taken on because it makes you feel connected and good? And how, if that's the case, how does that feeling connect to other practices from your upbringing, right? So, um, you know, does this does this give you a sense of connection to your ancestral line, to your home place, et cetera, to try and to try and point out that it, it has to connect to something else, I think. Mm -hmm. That was a beautiful answer and, and a great representative representative of the you know, California Institute of Integral Studies. That was great. You know, I think very similar to you, Amanda. I mean, my um I didn't explicitly share my cultural background. Um, I'm a first generation Indian American. And I noticed that they're also similarly, you know, from the Indian tradition, there were lots of teachers and gurus that wanted um, meditative wisdom, yogic wisdom, all of this to come to the West and influence people. And sometimes they exploited Westerners as, you know, being these gurus that, that were supposed to be um, omnipotent or something, you know. Um, and I think there's a difference in between cultural sharing and then commodification, right? And now we live in a capitalist world where, you know, folks do need to make a living and sometimes charge for certain services. But there's can be a sort of like um, a shallow, under, many peaks with very shallow understandings of these traditions, then like market themselves as experts and leaders. Um, and, and I think it is very complicated. I mean, I know personally for myself, I often just really rely upon my gut feeling. Like I have had, you know, um, mentors and elders who are like white folks who deeply, deeply studied like yogic tradition that I respect. And then there's other times I'll meet someone who, you know, is a self-proclaimed yoga teacher leader and something just doesn't feel right <laughs> in the way that they talk about it or speak about it. Um, but I think to kind of bring this back to an educational context, you know, where appropriate in our curriculum, you know, I, I think it's important to have that conversation about cultural appropriation and commodified spirituality. Um, and, you know, how everything in this um, culture is commodified, revolution is commodified, you can buy all this paraphernalia you know, made in who knows where, under what conditions to talk about, show how woke you are, you know, based on your t-shirts, right? And so I think we have to be very, 
you know, savvy and help our students become a little bit more savvy of navigating um, spaces in which everything becomes commodified. Right. Um, and really, you know, focusing on you know, indigenous teachings that I've read, you know, around like relationality, reciprocity, respect. Um, so it's not just a one way taking. Yeah, Shay Goarty, exactly, exactly. All right. Um, other reflections of how do we bring the sacred into the secular classroom? I think we cannot not, mm. in a way, because I think we are spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. And being teachers, we inevitably, I mean, not inevitably, some people try really hard not to. But if we bring our whole selves, mm -hmm. then spiritual is part of that. And then it resonates or not. And as somebody put in a chat, if we bring our own vulnerability or if we bring our own spirituality, that open space where students can willingly do that or not. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's, it's yeah. Uh, but, but having said that, I may say something contradictory. At my university, I'm doing it undercover. Mm. I'm doing it undercover. I'm not open about it with my colleagues, managers, hierarchy, and all this commodified university, which is absolutely horrid. I do it undercover in my classroom. And as long as nobody complains, I'm fine. Yeah. And yeah, that's, that's yeah. where I'm at so the I, moment. I mean, I think what you said is so thought provoking, Ksenia. Like, can you say more about the discipline in which you teach and why you have to do this undercover? Well, I'm, I'm teaching social work and I'm teaching in a Master of Applied Social Work program where I say we transform normal people into social workers. So people with bachelor degrees from various disciplines that are related to social work come and then it's two years they become social workers. So it is relatively small classes between 20 and 25. And they really believe in transformative learning because otherwise I get bored, <laughs> if nothing else. So I really believe in transformative learning. And I think that one cannot become an effective or competent social worker unless they address their own spirituality because our beliefs shape what we do. So I talk about meaning in life, purpose, why they are here, you know, and, and so I personalize everything. And in many years of my experience, students liked it. However, you asked me about undercover. Uh, we've got tick boxes, we've got learning outcomes, uh, we've got separation between secular and um, spiritual or religious. I've got students who do PhDs and thesis on it, but it is pitchy and, and I'm safer mm. to do it undercover. That's mm -hmm. what I believe. I don't know. Yeah. That's my belief system. But yeah. um, it's still in its baby phase, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank it's you. Still, Thank yeah. It's yeah. perceived as being alternative, wacky, different. Yeah. But I find that students really resonate well yeah. with it. Thank you. And I think sometimes we do as educators need to do things undercover, just like in places where people need to teach critical race theory undercover. Oh, totally. Because, and know? I think it's all related. Yeah. I think yeah. that spirituality without political arm, strong political arm, is flaky. Yeah. So I think it's all very integrated. Yeah. Thank you. And Amanda again. I hope it's okay. Absolutely. Um, yes. Thank you. I think to your question, how else to honor the sacred in the secular classroom and to some of what you're saying um, about having to do undercover um, or maybe strategically is a word I would use. Um, when, I, when I think about 
what aspects of the sacred are really key to me when I think about how I would distill them. There's some of the things that I've heard us all in conversation about during this time. So offering space for students to be in reflection, for students to process difficult subject matter, um, including sometimes, you know, if we are dealing with issues of race, um, of trauma, or just what it is to read statistic about one's lived reality, to have space for people to breathe, to process, to come to their responses. I think that is a practice of contemplation, of meditation, of sacredness. When I think about inviting students in with their whole self and holding the student in their, um, and, and I say student, but I mean as co-learners and co-teachers, right? For every person to get to come into that space as their full self with their dignity, because for me, the sacred is what connects my dignity to the dignity of all beings or of the, the planet that we live on. Um, so to be able to see each person in their wholeness um, is another way to bring that sacredness into the secular classroom. And then to have a co-creative collaborative space precisely by coming up with some of these um, guidelines, agreements, uh, touchstones, so that everybody feels invested in the wellness of the group of, of a whole. I don't know that any of these things I'm naming are explicitly spiritual, um, but I think they are for me all part of sacred work and spiritual work. Mm -hmm. And so especially in spaces where we have to do it strategically or undercover, these are some non-denominational, maybe non-specifically identifiable ways to bring that in. Um, even to state institutions, which is, you know, where a lot of my learning has yeah. taken place. So well said, so well said. And I, I want to acknowledge, you know, um, the comment made in the chat, which is that there's something, someone, Liz is having some feelings about um, being below the radar. And Liz, do you feel comfortable saying a few words about that? Is it that it feels inauthentic or sneaky? I think that's it. I think um, that, you know, my journey um, has led me to um, recognize that I live fully when I'm mm -hmm. living authentically, mm -hmm. when I live uh, in alignment with my values. And, you know, I'm not 30 <laughs> anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just want to live that way. Um, but I also, um, you know, a big part of my purpose and meaning is, uh, you know, helping to contribute to the shift in education and what counts as learning and knowledge and education. And so I bring in all these, um, you know, diverse and radical ideas. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, the feedback I get from students is absolutely phenomenal. It's mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, off the charts, phenomenal. I have no issues with that. But I have to kind of, you know, be a little covert <laughs> and fly under the radar. I call it sometimes being creatively compliant. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a, yeah. a term I have come up with to describe some of the things I do. But honestly, like I'm, I'm, I'm just getting a little bit fed up. Yeah, like, I don't know what the ter the term is. I don't know if it's tiring. I because it's one more thing to think about instead yeah. of just being able to go and be me. Yeah. I have to be like, oh yeah, be you, but like you know, just tone it down a bit, Liz, because so and so will be there, or so and so might be there, or fuck that. Yeah. Oh, I, I just want to do it. <laughs> I get, I get it, I get it, right? Because the, these systems can be very oppressive and. You know, I don't, I, I feel like called to share this. I, um, last year I read this book called Fugitive Pedagogy. And it was really about the black intellectual tradition um, and lineage of teachers living in deeply segregated and racist spaces where they had to very much undercover, like try to teach a more um, a, affirming of black lives and realities. Um, education in the classroom and they had to face like you know losing their jobs getting their houses stoned I mean all kinds of violence right for wanting to teach a more liberatory pedagogy and when I read that it kind of like 
was sort of shifted my perspective a little bit and thought like, you know, um, the risks that I have to take are so minimal comparatively. Um, and, you know, where, like, where is the time for me to take a more of a risk and be open and, you know, let the administration slap you on the wrist or something? And where is the time to, well, you know what is actually in the best interest of the students for me to stay here and keep doing this undercover, right? So, and, and I think everyone's path through that is gonna be, is gonna be different. And, you know, and again, I'm, I'm very blessed, fortunate to be at an institution where I don't have to be so undercover, but I imagine if I were teaching back at my alma mater and other spaces, I would be engaging in many of those same strategies. Um, so I, I think it is a really interesting line between, you know, doing it under the radar and yet, and also trying to push against some of those institutional barriers um, by maybe, you know, having to create reports of how this has been shown to help student learning or, you know, those types of things that administrators like. Um, but I'm so grateful to each of you for adding your voices or for just even being here and listening. Um, really, really enjoyed this conversation. Um, well, I look forward to causing paths with some of you again and uh, have a great rest of your day.